Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you another hands-on exploration of tutti chords from the back of Rimsky-Korsakov's book, Principles of Orchestration. As you may know, I'm currently creating an updated version of that book with cross-referencing, updated diagrams and charts, an improved index, and many, many annotations to help keep the text relevant in the 21st century. I've already released part A of chapter one, introducing the string section, along with extended audiovisual resources adding details that Rimsky-Korsakov left out, like finger positions and harmonics. Part B, introducing the woodwinds, is currently in production and should be coming next month. If you want to watch the video on string ranges and registers, click the playlist link and bookmark that page for further videos in this series. To read my book in progress, please join me on Patreon, where you can read chapters as I release them, even at the lowest level of support. For now, though, let's continue looking over Rimsky-Korsakov's 2D chords. We covered the first table of chords already in my Part 1 video. Jump back and watch that first if you missed it. So now let's take a look at the second table of 2T chords, all taken from various operas by the master, and all with different specific areas of focus for the orchestration devotee. Especially this rich, intense first chord from his opera, Ivan the Terrible. Rimsky-Korsakov is trying to offer his readers chords in different dramatic and harmonic contexts. The structure here is an E7 chord over its dominant of B, a 4-3 chord in figured bass notation, though admittedly the 7th is absent between the lowest octave Bs and the rest of the chord voicing. The dramatic context isn't terribly important here, except to mention that in the original score, the rest of the orchestra lets go of the chord halfway through the bar, leaving the bass clarinet continuing to trill all on its own, and then resolving to a much softer chord in the next bar. Before we break down the rest of the scoring, let's look at why Rimsky-Korsakov decided to use bass clarinet, instead of one of his A clarinets, which might easily play the same trill. The answer lies in both color and register. On a standard A clarinet, that sounding D would be a written Shalimo register F at the bottom of the treble staff, trilling back and forth with a throat tone G. Rimsky-Korsakov probably wanted to avoid the thinner sound that would result, so he simply gave the trill to the bass clarinet, which would play it with a richer, darker color in its clarino register, written an octave higher. But what gives this chord such an intense, somewhat claustrophobic sound? That's really what Rimsky-Korsakov wants you to study. And that quality arises whenever the orchestra stays full, but the sound picture condenses down. A chord of this harmonic and dynamic intensity might easily span five and a half octaves, reaching two octaves higher in winds and strings. Instead, we have a chord of three and a half octaves, with the winds clustered around the orchestra's mid-range. Oboes and clarinets doubling on a G-sharp third, with English horn taking the E root of that triad. And, as we already saw, bass clarinet taking the seventh of D one step below that. Then an octave below the oboes and clarinets, the bassoons play their G-sharp third. Up above, the flutes play a unison E, which is just added for a tiny bit of color and tone weight. But even if the trumpets weren't completely obliterating them with their fortissimo E octaves, the flute tone would probably be swallowed up by the overtones of the rest of the chord below. Speaking of those trumpets, notice that they're in A, and today their part would most likely be played on B-flat trumpets, with the player simply transposing the part at sight. So keep your contemporary trumpet parts in C or B-flat, and leave the A parts to old opera scores. Interestingly, Rimsky-Korsakov has scored his legendary alto trumpet in F doubling the second trumpet on that lower E, where it's tripled by the addition of first horn, not to mention quadrupled when you include the English horn. This heavy weight right in the middle also contributes to the closed-in, tense sound, as does the tripling of second and third horn and trombone on the same lower G-sharp third of the bassoons. 
The most tension, though, comes from the tripling of bass clarinet, first trombone, and cellos on that D. That closeness to the E above, along with the aggressive combination of tones, adds to the oppressive fustiness of the atmosphere. This leaves the upper strings at a bit of a loss, as they'll overweigh the top of the chord if they double the upper winds and trumpets. Or simply over-thicken and get buried in the trombones lower down. So Rimsky-Korsakov has them hit that 6-3 voicing inside the middle of the chord hard, with a fortissimo sforzando accent, and then just drop out. That just leaves the dominant underpinning of the chord, with contrabassoon, tuba, and double basses teaming up on that rock bottom B, and fourth horn adding a little dark color to the rolled timpani an octave higher. So really, except for that combination of timpani roll and fourth horn, every other pitch in this chord is at least tripled across different sections and families of instruments. For the next chord, it helps to have a bit of context in order to fully understand its meaning. This chord completes the second scene of the fairy tale opera Sadko, in which the titular character has just been promised wealth beyond his imaginings by the Sea King's daughter, who then departs along with her choir of sisters. The final passage of music illustrates her disappearance, leaving Sadko alone on the stage and then finishes the act with another one of Rimsky-Korsakov's epic sunrises. Just like the sunrise chord we studied in the part one video, this is a terrifically bright and energetic sound, and yet distinctly different in character from that previous chord. Looking at its structure, you can see that it's quite simple, just four stacked C major triads over an octave C root. Taking apart each of these triads reveals the reason right away. Rimsky-Korsakov has focused a lot of bright color and emphasis on the third triad from the bottom, and reinforced that emphasis with resonance from below and above. Let's start with that upper middle triad then. Notice that it's been quadrupled across the sections, with oboes plus English horn alongside three clarinets. Then adding tremolo first and upper divisi second violins, and then very forceful high A trumpets and first horn, all on that same simple C major triad. Above this blast of sound, the flutes play the top C major triad, underlining the overtones from the chord below more than creating a distinct sound of their own. Below, we also see sparser combinations of instruments, yet still with a lot of power. Second, third, and fourth horns sharing that lower middle triad with tremolo lower divisi second violins and violas. Then trombones playing all the pitches of the bottom triad with doubling on the root from A2 bassoons, rolled timpani, and tremolo cellos. Finally, the root octave C below is shared by our perennial standby low players on contrabassoon, tuba, and double basses. This is all a very straightforward, direct kind of scoring, and yet the results are fabulously radiant. <laughs> Let's jump back a few pages to the beginning of this final passage in the opera, with its ominous ascending chromatic line in lower double reeds, under slowly descending soft upper winds and tremolo violins. The Bolshoi Theater Orchestra in this 1950 recording has a terrifically powerful string section, which really helps you hear the importance of their emotional nuances in the drama of the scene. Finally, the dawn starts to break with gently lifting strings and clarinets giving over to flutes, as horns, winds, and tremolo strings push through to the final glorious tutti chord.
For this next chord, Rimsky-Korsakov jumps forward to the end of the next scene of the same opera with a lovely emotional contrast, as powerfully tragic as the previous chord was potently optimistic. This third scene portrays Sadko returning home to his loving wife, Lyubava, who he treats like a doormat, insults, and then abandons. Kudos to Rimsky-Korsakov for showing us what it feels like for the family that's left behind when a hero goes off to seek his fortune. Throughout the entire scene, the music really is on Lyubava's side, framing her self-doubts, longing for affection, and then final agony at Sadko's rejection, in a real tour de force for the mezzo role. The final chord, which we're studying now, is preceded by two similarly scored chords, each resolving to a C major chord over pulsing back and forth half steps in the bassoons and lower strings. When the concluding C minor chord ends the scene, it has a feeling of emotional incompleteness, a marker stone along the path of a continuing journey for the character, who will need to reclaim her relationship by the end of the opera. The first thing to notice about this chord is its huge power, despite having a somewhat smaller scope than usual for one of Rimsky-Korsakov's scene-ending tutti chords. Lacking auxiliary wind, such as bass clarinet or contrabassoon, without even a tuba, and having a mere three and a half octave range. And yet it doesn't feel all that claustrophobic like the first chord in this video. Rather, it's hugely ferocious, tormented rather than tense. To find out why and how, Let's look at which instruments are playing the C octaves throughout the chord, rather than breaking things down section by section. And what we find are second bassoon and double basses on the low C root. Heavy enough, but not too heavy when the contrabassoon and tuba are left out. Then the next C up is shared by first bassoon, third trombone, rolled timpani, and the lower pitch of tremolo cellos. This puts most of the weight higher, with a somewhat snarling sound. Stacked on top of this fundamental octave in the bass, the B-flat trumpets and lower pitches of tremolo first violins and violas play the upper C octave. Once again, just like the lowest pitch, we see power but not overwhelming intensity. The trumpets might play out a bit over the upper strings, but the tremolo of the latter will keep them from disappearing and help to keep the whole chord more edgy. So now that we have all the C's in this chord diagrammed out, all you have to do is look at how many instruments are, in fact, playing the other pitches of E flat and G, and you can see that it's quite a few. In fact, all the upper winds are sitting on that top E flat third, with doubling from upper pitches of first and second violins. That is a fearsome amount of stress at the top of the chord, far outshining the first trumpet right below it. Then we see something similar an octave down, with the next E-flat third played by an aggressive combination of A2 horns on the G and third horn plus first trombone on the E-flat, with, of course, the remaining pitches of second violins and violas along for the ride. Once again, this will sound much fiercer than the simple combination of second trumpet and the lower pitch of the violas on that middle C right beneath the trombone and horns. And then just to fill things in architecturally, while adding more weight via their overtones, the second trombone and upper pitch of the cellos sits on that G below. And that is the solution to the puzzle. With some very judicious, colorful placement and balancing of pitches, Rimsky-Korsakov has put most of the weight on the third and fifth of this chord. Not ridiculously so, but just enough so that it keeps our expectations from settling into a feeling of completion at the end of the scene. It really helps that there's no C on top of the chord, so the brightest, most prominent pitches are at the top of the C minor triad.
One last little observation. You may have noticed that I avoided using the word divisi when describing the separate pitches of those intervals in the strings. This is because, considering both the fortissimo dynamic and the scoring of the pitches, it's pretty obvious that Rimsky-Korsakov intends that they be played non-divisi. Simple enough for all the instruments, though the tuning might be a little tricky for the first violins on that high C-fifth. But the interlocking pitches in the violins make them much easier to play and to tune, rather than if they were stacked. And then below, thirds are pretty easy for violas, as are fifths for cellos. This video is getting long enough already just explaining those first three chords, so let's stop here for now, but watch for the second half of part two, coming in a day or two. Thanks so much for joining me as we look through this remarkable collection of tutti chords from the back of Rimsky-Korsakov's book, and I hope to see you for the next few chords from Table 2. Oh, oh, oh.